is the Swans Cast Extra, the number one Sydney Swans fans weekend preview podcast. In this week's episode, we look back at the first half of the season and preview the Swans round 14 match against the Hawks at the SCG. We discuss John Longmire's situation, review the season so far, we discuss selections and preview the match ahead. This is Justin, with me tonight is regular guest Josh. So we've been away for a couple of weeks, uh, a lot has happened in those last couple of weeks, some uh, some mega news coming out of the AFL, uh, most recently Jaden Stevenson's indiscretion with uh, Gamblor. I think uh, Homer Simpson might have something to say about that. Gamblor. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me the amount of bloody Simpsons references you have, mate. Uh, but yes, Gamblor. Gamblor has struck again. The only monster here is a gambling monster that has enslaved your mother. I call him Gamblor, and it's time to snatch your mother from his neon claws. Yes, uh, as for those who do or don't know, he has copped a $10,000 fine. He has also copped a uh, 22-week suspension with 12 of those suspended. So uh, he actually bet on himself in one of the matches and on his teammates. Now, there's no accusation of match fixing, but the fact that he actually bet on himself is a very, very big problem. No, it is. Um, and he also bet on the performance of members of his own team to perform. And that's ultimately actually how he got caught and that he made a passing reference to Jeremy Howe that he must have needed another another goal or so many more touches and then his multi would have paid out. Um, that's how it first came to their attention. So uh, not only uh, despite all the education these guys get around not betting on their own games... And he failed to heed that advice. He then dobbed himself in without realising he'd dobbed himself in. Yeah, yeah. Look, he got a good outcome. The uh, the flip side is that had it been any worse and had there been any question of uh, Max Fitching, uh, had there been any question of match fixing, he could have easily copped a year ban and basically had his career ended on the spot. So drug drugs are one thing. You can always get redemption from uh, from taking drugs. But as far as like match fixing, that is right up there with the worst cheating. Uh, It's literally saying you will sell your soul to win. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. That's true. It's interesting this came at a time when uh, there's a bit of argy-bargy in the media between the AFLPA and uh, some psychologist who deals with um, managing players with gambling addiction. And that also comes at a fortuitous time for... Yeah. Yeah, well, it also comes at a fortuitous time for... uh, for, for Ben Stratton, um, <laughs> old Jaden Stevenson might have taken a bit of the heat off him this oh, week. Yes. I think. Uh, yes. Yeah, but um, <laughs> both both absolute peanuts. Both have done the wrong thing. And I have to wonder: Do you reckon he had bets on himself for the Rising Star last year? It does make you wonder. It really does make you wonder. And what he was saying in his uh, press conference and in the uh, information that was coming out was he didn't understand what he had done wrong at all. He just thought he was having a cheeky bet. And it's not like he's coming into the system without any knowledge or without any education. There is a ton of knowledge and education, not only at club level, but also player level before they even enter the system. Once they enter the system, the club goes through all their anti-gambling policies. The league goes through it. The AFLPA goes through it. Uh, their psychologists and support systems go through uh, go through with it. So it's not like he didn't know. So he no, that's true. totally screwed up on this one. Absolutely screwed up. But... Probably the bigger news for us, as far as Sydney Swans go, is the conjecture around the coach at the moment. Will Horse be in Sydney next year? Yeah, it is. uh, It's a a big topic. And I think it would be uh, remiss of me to basically, if I didn't bring it up, it's got to be the fan sort of point of view on what... John Longmire is and has been for the club for the last couple of years. And there's been, since the 2014 grand final, there's been a uh, a very, I don't know, angry small group that's kind of grown in size and grown in voice. It's the anti-John Longmire group. It, it's almost the same as Arsenal had with Arsene Wenger. Just a minority and it just grew and grew and grew. It's not quite a cacophony, but there is certainly a large portion of 
supporters who voiced their opinions on the internet who were very much against him. Now, I'm not one of those uh, people. I'm not sure if you're one of those people, Josh. But the situation with No, I'm a bit of a fence sitter. Yeah, look, I I wouldn't say I'm a fence sitter. I'm more of a I'd like to keep him on because he's done a good job. But the situation with North Melbourne is just absurd at the moment. And he's not shutting down any questions. He's kind of just stirring the pot. He's stoking the flame by, you know, saying nothing. No, that's right. And if you compare the... uh, we Actually, we might play that interview now and have a discussion about it. What do you reckon? Speculation's obviously going to keep rolling on until they've appointed a, a full-time coach. Um, I know you spoke a couple of weeks about it, but do you sort of wish that there's a bit more certainty out there that it's, um, you know, isn't a possible distraction or anything like that? No, I haven't got more to add, really. I'm, uh, from what I added, what I spoke about a couple of weeks ago, it's not something that's um, that's in my control. It's um, it's something that I'm focused on here is making sure we win against the Hawks, and then I'll be focused on the week after that and. And uh, and trying to get the best out of our, our young playing group. That's what I'm I'm focused on delivering, and um, that's all I can worry about. Is this spoken with players at all? I mean, I suppose it's one thing to come up here on Monday, and there might be a question every now and then about it. But have you spoken to the group about? Don't worry about your re- what you're reading, or don't worry about any of that. No, it's not something that we need to worry about. It's not something that's um, that's you focus on. It's something for other people to talk about but we internally whether it's form or anything else we we focus on what we need to do from week to week we've always done it that way and i'm sure you guys that have spoken to me over the years realize that and uh and that's what we'll continue to do it's um we'll worry about our processes from week to week does obviously sorry, does it interest you at all the north melbourne job i'm not commenting on that job because it's, as i've said a couple of weeks ago i've got a job here and that's what i'm focused on He's not exactly smacking down the talk, is he? You know, uh, Alistair Clarkson basically told everyone last week they were dreaming and there wasn't any chance they were going to pry him out of Hawthorne. They might as well go somewhere else. But <laughs> Horse leaves the door open. He's not exactly saying, I'm not gettable. And there's a couple of ways you can read it. One is that he's he's leveraging the speculation against the Swans because his contract is up for renewal. And certainly the Swans want to recontract him. Pridham said last week that, you know, he, he he sort of drew an analogy or a comparison between John Longmore and looking at a boat and a mariner that you might like the boat and you can look at it, but you certainly can't touch it. Um, yeah. And Liam Pickin in the last few days, his manager's come out and said basically, oh, we haven't had any discussions with anybody other than Sydney. Well, he said the same thing about Lance Franklin as well when he was at Hawthorne. So I don't know how much how much stock you put in. Exactly. Yeah. Until he had that fruity and <laughs> slip. Oh, Sydney. Oh, I meant GWS, yeah. Sydney. <laughs> I meant GWS. Um, so <laughs> By look, then, I, I don't know. I don't know which way report. to take it. Look, um, yeah. Look, I, I don't know which way to take it. Yeah. What, what, what's your thoughts? I I think he's more likely to go than stay at the moment. Yeah. Look, the first press conference, I I, I remember the first press conference he did probably what like three weeks ago, three four weeks ago, and he didn't prevent any questions. I think he actually left it intentionally uh, vague and an up for question in the way that he responded, which was, I have a contract. I haven't been offered yeah. a new contract. I have a contract, which means, okay, North Melbourne haven't offered him terms, but they're clearly talking to him. They've most likely been talking to him for a couple of weeks. And the latest press conference is, well, maybe they've actually offered him terms and maybe the terms are significantly more than Sydney are going to offer him or can afford to give him. And the rumours have been anywhere from one to one and a half million dollars per year. There's even one rumour where it's 1.6 million per year. I mean, it'd be insane to turn down money like that. I mean, even if it was coaching Carlton for 1.6 million dollars a year, yeah, you take it. For three years, that's a lot of money. That's going to set you up in the long term. Absolutely. And it's not just about whether or not he is, uh, whether he's loyal to the Sydney Swans or not, because he absolutely will be even if he leaves. He'll still have, you know, a place at the Swans um, for all time. You know, he's a premiership winning coach. No one's ever going to be able to take that achievement yeah. away from him. And if you believe that we got dudded in the 2016 grand final, well, then you, you've also got to admit that he probably should be a two times yeah. premiership winning coach. But at some stage, your own self-interest has to take over. If someone is going to offer you absurd volumes of money to come and work for them for three, four, five years, and you're starting to look at your end game, you know, life after football, life in yeah. retirement, well, take the job you don't want as much and make the coin, you know? Like, no one would ever no one would ever be grudging for making that kind of money. Yeah, and, and look, there is some of that go-home factor as well. It's funny that we kind of bring that up, and a lot of people bring have been bringing that up, and it's not go home as in you're one of those players who go up to Brisbane or the Gold Coast Suns and you want to go home because for like five, six years they were trash, right? 
it's going back to his spiritual football home of North Melbourne, where he enjoyed so much success for more than a decade of his football life. He was in two premierships. They played seven prelims in a row. Um, he's in the New South Wales team of the century. Um, he's regarded as one of the more, I guess, one of the better full forwards and centre-half forwards in, in football over the last 30 years. And he has such a reverence at North Melbourne that he'd almost be worshipped as he steps in the door. So there is that factor. No, that's right. But uh, um, I think it, people get confused about what go home is for him. Like, more, more, I'm, I'm speaking, probably putting words in his mouth here, but go home, when I hear that term used in reference to horse, I think more about him going home to his actual home, which is Corowa, southern New South Wales, on the Murray River, you know, family farm. I could see him going to North for a few years, making a big packet of money, then heading home to run the farm where his folks still yeah, are. Yeah. Um, that sounds like home. Yeah, it's... It's more of a spiritual home for him, but uh, look, his legacy in Sydney, and I'm glad you brought that up because he's Sydney's uh, longest serving coach. Uh, he's coached the most games. He's, uh, I think he's Sydney's most successful coach in their history. Uh, he's made three grand finals f for one win. He hasn't not played finals in his tenure and um, he's coached since 2011. So his record, I think, speaks for itself and he's coached nearly the same amount of time that uh, Paul Roos coached. But yeah, look, uh, North Melbourne are going to have to offer something big, and, and lately they haven't had a good record at all of um, offering good money and getting any quality for it. No, no, they haven't. I think, look, I, I think at the end of the day, I think at the end of the day, he would probably like to go to North and try and make something of that club. I don't know whether Sydney would be willing to release him given the amount of teams in the market at the moment for a senior coach. But I would say this, if for some reason Sydney let Longmire go, he leaves the club with a pretty good list at the moment, a new and exciting developing game style. And that's probably not a bad way to leave. It's probably like, I mean, if that's the legacy he leaves, if he finishes up this year and, and we go out with a really grass looking list, a bunch of really good young players, it's it's not a horrible way to go. Like the club would yeah. be in good shape on the way out the door. The question is, can we get another senior coach who is as good as him? And that's the bit yeah. that worries me. Yeah, look, if if that sort of situation comes to comes to pass, I think his legacy is going to be very similar to Paul Ruse in that he did very, very well with a with a list that was kind of questionable, probably missed out when he should have actually got a bit more. But most importantly, he left the list in a very good situation that the next coach could do something with. And that was probably one of the best things that when Paul Ruse ended his tenure, he left the list in such a good position. They were in the finals the next year. Uh, I mean, in his final year, they played a semi-final. So, yeah. you know, it's not Mick Malthouse, Collingwood played the grand final. I don't want to go. <laughs> it's he was out, and you know the list won a grand final two years after he finished up. So you know that's that's the legacy. But look, uh, we could practically talk about John Longmire for the rest of this podcast. We've got so much more to go on with. Let's yeah, do, let's do it. Let's do a mini review of the Just season. Just watch so this far. space. Yeah, yeah, watch what, it. Three more months of listening to this. Watch this space. <clears throat> exactly. So rounds one to seven. <laughs> we were all one and six Garbage. again. Terrible. Garbage, yeah. Our, our only good game was against Carlton, which is different to 27 because we were shocking against Carlton <laughs> that year. <laughs> that was the catalyst, actually. And in hindsight, it actually wasn't that good. We were just happy to get a bloody win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't a, it wasn't a classic match. It's not something I'm going to put on replay. Uh, we lost a couple of really poor matches in, in that run as well. Um, most notably, Melbourne. We, we should have belted Melbourne. They should have been down by seven goals in the second quarter, and, and we gifted that match back to them. But uh, look, you provided me with a list of topics you wanted to talk about. So, Josh, run with it, man. Man, you, you wouldn't use, you wouldn't dare say that if you saw how I ran. I mean, a fast waddle <laughs> is about as good as it's going to get. So, look, I, I think you can look at the first half of the season. It's a tale of two halves, isn't it? And it's round th one through seven, which was just there was one semi decent game, which was the Carlton game. There was a couple of games where we played one decent court and the rest of it was pretty trash. And we've sort of spoken about various bits and pieces as to why that's occurred over the last few months, but we should just try and pull that together a little bit tonight and bring together some of the reasons as to why that occurred. And 
And um, I think we identified a few things over the last few weeks. And one was basically our bottom six to nine players every game for those first few rounds were just not at AFL standard at all. And there was various yeah. reasons as to why that happened. And one of them were was experienced players. And I'm, I'm really talking about Mills and Reed coming off season-ending injuries from the year before. And in the case of Reed, two seasons worth of season-ending injuries. Yep. And then at, to a lesser extent, you're throwing like Jackson Thurlow, who he hadn't played much senior football after rehabbing from an ACL, I think it was. He was just brought in on the side. And then we've got some really young punks who were trying to prop up the team. So I'm talking about your Tommy McCartans, your Nick Blakey's. You know, two 18-year-old kids, a couple of new guys in Thurlow and Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark, we played out of position for a few weeks until we found out he's actually a legitimate tagger. Yep. Um, and then we've got some of our senior players who came into the the season with very limited or no pre-seasons, in, you know, when you start talking about the Lance Franklins of the world, um, or just out of form. Like Luke Parker was just a complete non-attendance for the first four weeks of the year. Yeah. I'm glad he woke up again. He's had, he's had a cracking, he's had a cracking uh, season since round seven or eight onwards. Um, McVeigh started off slow, got injured, came back, out injured again. George Hewitt had a really slow start to the year. He was well below the lofty oh, yeah. heights that yeah. he set himself at the end of last season. Kennedy was up and down as well. Lloyd. So Lloyd was getting Lloyd. a ton of possessions, but he was doing absolutely Gents. nothing with it. No, that's right. And it's funny, actually, there was an article in the land down under today saying that he's likely to get back-to-back best and fairest. And I'm thinking, well, he, he might have racked up some numbers and he's good for your fantasy team, but he had no impact at all for the first two months of the season. Yeah. Um, and we don't have him anywhere near then, the top at the moment in our own play ratings. Oh, like last, God, no. last year, we had him pretty close to the top we said he's a really good chance of top three top three if not top five this year i would honestly be surprised if he was even close to top five at the moment no that's right um someone else who's just not perform who well and still not performing actually is ben ronk has just yeah. fallen off the planet and he's not even doing that well in the resis at the moment i, I i'm not surprised he's listed as an emergency for the weekend because he's not having a good year um and then add to that grundy uh, in for one game, played as a ruckman, yep. and now he's retired injured. Um, yep. Smooch, <laughs> I'd say Smooch is done. Kieran Jack, I'd say Kieran Jack's done as well. Yep. Well, it took two, two and a half months to be able to find a way to move the team around and, and, and get those guys back into some form or, you know, recover some of their match fitness. And then you've got the structural issues that we've got. Absolute lack of of four quarters of effort. I don't care about disposal or amount of goals kicked or any of that other garbage, but we literally would show up for 15 minutes for a match some weeks. Yeah. Absolutely zero forward 50 pressure for many, many games um, and getting absolutely smashed in the ruck week in, week out because as good as Sinkers was last year, he's not as good this year, but he's not a ruckman. He's a bloody forward. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And I think you can put some of that down to the fact that Ronk came into the season under a massive injury cloud and... Longmire admitted straight away that he shouldn't have played him. He wasn't fit. Karen Jack wasn't fit. He no. came in off uh, groin or hip or something. And within like half the game, he was injured again. I mean, yeah, sure, he got a head knock, but he was still injured. He actually re-injured himself. So the two times he's played, he's re-injured his hip. Gary Rowan's gone. I mean, Gary Rowan was a good pressure forward, even though some of his stats didn't really uh, back that up. But yeah, look, those players, they're like Jack's gone. Ronk, we don't know, uh, and um, Gary Rowan's gone. So now I've had to bring in some some new players through. Tom Papley's forward half work has exploded. Nick Blakey's added a fair bit to that forward line. Tom McCartan's added a bit as well. So while those more established players are gone, they, the less known, the lesser players have come up and have come through big time. They have. I guess the, and it probably goes back to what we spoke about last week. If you didn't listen to last week's podcast, go and check that out. Again, we came in uh, with the usual, just go and win contested ball. Just win it. Just win it. Smack it forward. If you lose control of the ball, who cares? Just win it back again. And we clearly have, we, we clearly are unable to do that anymore. And uh, finally, after two years of trying the same crap over and over again, it yeah. finally looks like we've gone, right, we have to change the way we do business. And I think we agreed last week that since round eight, it looks like we have made a concerted effort to change the way. We win the ball and move the ball. Is that yeah. is that a fair enough statement? Yeah, and I think that coincides with several players coming back to form. So Mills's form over the last month has been pretty good. He he has been in some good nick. Alia has been amazing. Rampy's been amazing. And this also coincides with the time that we've had Kennedy out of the side, Cunningham out of the side, Jones out of the side. 
And those were the three best players of the first seven, eight rounds of the season. So to lose them, I think most of us kind of went, and, and McVay as well, we all kind of went, oh shit, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm not sure where the wins are going to come from. And yet we've actually won three from our last five matches, including belting the Premiers from last year. Yep, and and we're very competitive against the best team in the competition, uh, with the exception well, the of the best two teams. Yeah, ten minutes of complete retardation, which gave up eight goals. And we could have, and probably should have beaten Collingwood. Yeah, so absolutely, it's it's been an impressive turnaround, and we've talked about it previously. We talked about it back in 2017 when we were doing the podcast, a bit like, what the hell's going on? We we got an idea. We can kind of see what they're trying to do, but it's just not working. I wonder if now it's just a case of they've had two more seasons to work into the players and they've gone back to what they were trying to do two years ago and it's just finally clicked because no one's playing contested ball anymore. And no. you can see with the way that the teams are lining up, with the rule changes, you can't play contested because... Contested teams need strong players in the middle, and they typically lack outside runners. Probably Hawthorne is really the only team, and Western Bulldogs to some extent, they're the only two outliers to that. Uh, you know, Fremantle aren't playing contested anymore. Sure, they're winning the ball, but they're not playing contested. They're playing uncontested. Uh, Brisbane are basically an outside team. They can win it, but they're mostly an outside team now. So that that's where the AFL's going, and, and the Swans, they've had to transition with that. And I think their stats back that up. You know, 400-plus disposals last week. Absolutely. So if you compare round one through seven, we, we were basically, with the exception of tackles, um, I think we were still ranked first in the lead for tackles. We were literally bottom four in every metric uh, in the game, including winning contested ball. I think we've narrowed that up a bit since round eight. We've narrowed that up since round eight. We're not as reliant. We don't we, we don't win it, but we can't lose it by 20 or 30 a week. Um, we're the most efficient team once we go inside forward 50 in the competition at the moment. We tackle more than any other team still, which is surprising considering the amount of times we've actually lost a tackle count. We're getting a much more even contribution from our from our bottom six to nine players. Um, those players from the earlier in the season who are out of form have really come back into their own, especially George Hewitt. Sam Reid has finally showed us a glimpse of the forward we always knew he could be. And Luke Parker um, as well, especially. I mean, he's been absolutely amazing for us in midfield. He's been brilliant, hasn't he? Um, since since he had his own personal line in the sand moment, he's been absolutely amazing for us. And then just the natural development of some of our guys as well. Um, I'll let you talk about the bloke whose man babies you want to have. Um, <laughs> Ryan Clark, the butcher, um, has had a great month doing that shutdown role yep. we've given him. So we're in this interesting position where we've got two guys who are genuine taggers who can not only win contested ball while limiting or completely shutting down their opponent, but they can also win enough of their own ball back to have an impact themselves. I just yeah. don't want to ever see Ryan Clark kick a ball ever again. <laughs> if you can avoid it, just channel Prittis. Just channel Matt Prittis. That's all you yeah, can do. Just... <laughs> and Sam Mitchell. <laughs> he doesn't have he doesn't have the he doesn't have the blonde curly hair to go no, with the Matt, the Matt Prittis thing. <laughs> no, but Matt Prittis was the quintessential plotter who could not kick the ball. <laughs> So, just, oh, he was just, dreadful, wasn't just be he? like Matt Prittis. That's all you got to do, Clark. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, the since since round eight, the quality of our forward fifty entries has exponentially got better from week to week. I was interested in the post game uh, two weeks ago that they said something. One of the the guys on the sideline interviewing Franklin said something about this, and Franklin said, "Oh, well, our forward fifty connection our midfield forward half connection's been you know pretty poor for the last two years and i'm sitting there thinking oh thank god someone finally someone from the team has finally said <laughs> yeah. hey what we've been doing has not been good yeah. enough but probably one of the things that's really impressed me the most since round eight is that finally horse looks like he has tried to reinvent himself yeah he has said that he said that in a couple of press conferences and i think it was also important when he laid down the challenge to the player group publicly and he did it subtly you had to like kind of read in between the lines of his press conference after that uh round seven uh loss was he said oh we're not in a rebuild but we're kind of like he basically said we're in a rebuild and and, and you know we're, we're not going to win every week and we're going to we're going to lose games and you know it's never going to come together and then they came out and no. They, they were breathing fire the next week. You know, they came out with a point to prove. And sometimes you just need that, you know, bit of a cattle prod up the backside sort of moment. But look, we've had some excellent just, contributions from players across the board as well. Oh, yeah. I just wonder uh, I just wonder whether um, 
coming into this season, being under a little bit of pressure from the way our season ended last year, which, let's face it, was absolutely shit house. Um, yeah, no losing question. in that fashion to GWS was horrific. Whether Horse and, and maybe by extension the coaching staff or maybe just holding the reins a little bit too tight knowing they were fueling an inexperienced list instead yeah. of just loosening them off and letting them go. Did you see that? I just made I just made a pun about horse halt, you know, and reins and stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a complete accident. I'm very proud of that. Um, whether maybe they were just holding on a little bit too tight and 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 actually restricting um, restricting some of the boys from playing their natural game because they seem to have a lot more freedom to just create at the moment and probably not as rigid in the way we try and move the ball compared to early in the season and it's definitely the last couple of years. It's it's a fair point. And I think there's also, I want to bring this back to what you said before to the forward 50 entry. You can see at the moment, like you look at the coaching box footage over the last month or so, and you can see all the coaches, the animated, but they're more positive animated than they were early in the season, which was more, you know, folder slamming, hand slapping, angry faces, you know, swearing like sailors sort of thing, you know, nothing's kind of working hands in face kind of behavior. Now they're all, okay, let's try and fix what just happened. But for the most part, it's working. And you could see just how happy they were against West Coast when it all just clicked all at once. I, it parallels with what's happened at Carlton and North Melbourne, right? Those teams, and, and you're right, like there was that, that handbrake element where the teams were almost strangled by the pressure and Sydney certainly were affected by that earlier in the season. I think the way that the season ended last year and having some expectation again at the start of this season when there probably never really should have been any expectation, they just seemed to be um, not quite playing for each other, not really uh, playing for themselves, more just constricted and strangled and really unsure of what they were doing. And it really showed in a way that they were moving the ball. There was some, you know, nearly moments, you know, nearly beat the Western Bulldogs, even though probably didn't deserve to. Uh, we're up against Melbourne and we should have won that, but we didn't because, to be honest, we didn't really deserve to. I, I think the way that the ball use is now going these days, which is quite good. We're actually right up there now for um, for foot accuracy, which is mind-boggling. It, it, it kind of, uh, it, it's it's almost in symmetry with the way the uh, the team is playing with confidence now, which is something that Colton and North Melbourne just couldn't do. So for John Longmire to basically not only reinvent himself, but also get the team to do a, a complete 180. And as far as their confidence goes, bring it back. They've got the mojo back. And they didn't yeah. even have to fire yeah, the coach they to do a lot it. Better. They didn't have to fire the coach to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, no, they didn't. So to uh, Colton so, and get- North Melbourne... <laughs> <laughs> it's a good old-fashioned raspberry for you guys. <laughs> so that's true. Raspberries all around. So given that, Justin, yep. what was your best win of the year? Oh, look, I think we're both going to agree on this one. It was the Eagles win. Uh, Absolutely. The two, the two wins... I'm going to talk had... about a different game, but yeah, it was the Eagles. <laughs> yeah, look, the two, the two that we had back-to-back, the Essendon and North Melbourne games, they were great. Um, but I can't think of too many better wins outside of finals actually i can't think of a single better win outside of finals for a very long time than the eagles win that would that was shit let's face it that was shit that were dreadful but i think that was because we forced them to be but for me it, yeah. it was such a big win because we had no bench for almost an entire half we had one player on the bench, and at one point that was Nick Blakey getting his ankle restrapped, or Ali Ali getting his thumb restrapped. So we had no bench. Yeah, and we still yeah, that's flogged true. them. That's absolutely true. We completely beat them. That that, that, that was an categories. amazing game. That's easily the best game we've had for a couple of years. For a very long time, outside of grand finals and finals, for a very long time. Uh your best win. Ah, uh, look, I mean, I'm going to go with the Eagles, but I'm just going to give a special mention to the game against North yeah. down at uh, Blundstone yeah. Arena. Just just a, a few things. Uh, Blundstone's a bit of a fortress for them. It was cold. Uh, I think we finished with three on the bench. Jones did his hamstring, I think, and, and Heaney copped a hit to the head, passed the concussion test, but was clearly not himself for yeah. the rest of the game. And I just thought there was a couple of things in that game that... Um, that were really that started to bode really well for the future. One, I, I've been singing this kid's praises for like six weeks now, but Ryan Clark, I just thought that job he did on Higgins was amazing. And our back six just announced that, you know, we're still a force to be reckoned with down here. It's just everybody else four to the half back line who can't get this shit together. Yeah. Um, 
So, which is probably one can well actually one consistent for the whole first half of the season has been our back six again. Yeah, they've been a little bit ratty at times, but they're still clearly showing uh, that yeah. they've got what it takes. Especially Rampy and Ali have just been absolute rocks down there. They have now uh, your worst loss of the uh, first half of the season, please, Josh. I reckon I reckon you're going to go with the, the game against the D's, but I'm going to go with round one for me against the Dogs, and and the reason being is that we were so lackluster and listless and just looked like crap, and then and then almost undeservedly stole the game back after the way our fi- our final series ended the year before. I wanted a response, like I wanted them to come back and show intent, and there was absolutely no bloody intent whatsoever. And people go, it's just round one, we always start slow, it doesn't matter. It's like, well, they all matter, because they're all worth four points, right? Yeah. And I was I was really disappointed. I wanted a response to the, the way the season ended the year before, and I didn't get it. Yeah. Look, um, I'm going to have to go Melbourne game, but the Adelaide game, <laughs> the Adelaide game gets a special mention because... Oh, that was so winnable. They were down on numbers and just... Oh, we spotted that up something fierce. And we talked about it in the preview podcast. Don't let Jacobs have a day out. What happened? We let him have a day out. And he absolutely yep. killed us in the ruck. Uh, well, we were dreadful. But yeah, the Melbourne game. Oh boy, the Melbourne game. Um, yeah, yeah. We should have been up by six, seven goals in that second quarter alone. Oh, I still got nightmares of watching Nathan Jones stapping from the pocket. Some of the most arse goals yeah. you'll ever see. And, you know, at, at, at that time, it was like, okay, Sydney's got a chance, you know, to make finals. They've got their first win against Carlton. Maybe the first two matches are aberrations. They were in it, but they just couldn't get over the line. And then they just produced that absolute shit fest against Melbourne. And uh, yeah, Melbourne were under pressure. They were 9-3 and three at the time. So they were, they were under a lot of pressure. And to be fair... I think uh, that game kind of sums up the season, really. We were dreadful. They weren't particularly good. But in the end, yeah. their first yep. their first quarter and a half really represents the, the first half of the season, which is just shit. So, yeah. Yep. yeah yep. I'm glad game. you gave a special mention of that game against the Crows. Oh, that was... Oh. Uh, I, I made a special trip through Sydney. I was in northern New South Wales. I was coming home back to Victoria, and I went through Sydney to watch that game at the SCG. And, yeah, I uh, feel bad for you for that one. <laughs> just that, yeah, it was crap because we kind of butt-fumbled around for sort of a half and then tried to get it going at the start of the third and then didn't and then just capitulated yeah. in the fourth and just the scoreline flattered them. They were terrible, but we were worse, and it was just pretty disheartening. Yeah, Climbers, exactly. most improved player for you this year. Oh, uh, man, man, child, man, child for me. It's got to be, it's got to be a Leah, a Leah. <laughs> he, he can have my babies. I'm, going, I'm giving him my firstborn son, and he can name it Mr. Mr. Little T if he wants to. But that guy <laughs> has been a star for us. And I've got to say, Rampy's been amazing in defense, but the way that Ali's been playing, it's allowed Rampy to play his role and play at the best of his possible skill level. And it basically, he's allowed Rampy to be Rampy what he was a couple of years ago, right? He's yeah. no longer having to lock down their best forward because oh, Malikin's not particularly good at it, and he's kind of getting his ass handed to him. But ali has been good enough to actually do the job on whoever he's been on. And he's factored in our votes. He's factored in the player of the year votes uh, for the fans. So, look, his, his development has been outstanding this year. Uh, climber yeah. for you. Josh. He has been the difference between us losing and us losing by another five or six goals. Yes, some games like yep. we could have been absolutely blown off the park earlier this year if it wasn't for him. Well, also you look at the wins against Essendon and North Melbourne. We we certainly wouldn't have won North Melbourne without him. So, no, God no. Yeah, not at all. So he's been amazing for us, and he was amazing again against the Eagles. He was one of the best players in that game, and he still didn't even get a look in on the AFLCA. So disappointing. <laughs> uh, my first climb is going to be Ryan Clark. Maybe this is the guy who I want to have my man babies with. He uh, look, <laughs> he was brought in as a, yeah, he, he was brought in as a speculative trade. He we, we played him out of position uh, just like North did. He's uh, in his draft year. He was considered to be a potentially elite ball winning mid. And funnily enough, when we actually play him as a mid, he does a heck of a lot better than he does as a defender. Yeah, his ability to shut down a player and still win enough of his own ball to be impactful has been amazing. Uh, especially when you consider 
some of the players he shut down, Higgins, Sidebottom, you know, Gaff. Uh, he had a few really good moments running on Pendlebury as well. Don't forget Dylan um, Shield as well. And there was even that Dylan meme. Shiel. There was even that meme that came out like at three quarter time. You know, the guy with a stick poking at one of those like dead bodies, and it had Dylan Shield's head on it. It was like, come on, do yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> do something. Hey, I just think for what we traded for him, he's been a fantastic pickup, and uh, he's the epitome of a of a recycled player coming to Sydney and restarting their career. And I know I'm probably on that bandwagon a little bit too early, but I can't see him being chopped at the end of the year at the moment. Yeah. He's, been, he's gone from being a throwaway player to be actually being quite important to us. Well, it, it's an interesting one, and we'll move on, move on to the next part in a second, but it's an interesting one because at the start of the season, he was brought in to play basically that Dan Hannaby role, and he was so, so bad at it because that's not what he's good at. And he had nearly 50 games at North Melbourne to prove that that is not his best position, right? Even his draft profile was elite runner, poor ball user, probably will be better as an inside slash run with player, right? That was his draft profile. Yep. So they bring him back and what do they do? They play him as a tagger. What does he do? He exploits his elite athleticism and his strength because he's a very strong player, and he's running with Dylan Schill, who is a very good runner, who's very quick, and not only does he beat him, he beats him comfortably and gives him an absolute pantsing, and he shows that he's actually not a slouch around the field. He's actually pretty quick as well. So I think he's he um, quick. he's been a bit of a Hewitt for us this year as to what Hewitt was last year. You know, a bit of a surprise. For well, and, and you, you could argue that you could argue it's freed Hewitt up a little bit more. Yeah. Um, instead of just running Hewitt as a run with, we've been able to let Hewitt loose a little bit more to, to do some more creation of his own. Um, yeah. so I like it. Look, I um, like what they look like. And on Hewitt, we'll move into the sliders in a moment, but on Hewitt, I think with Josh Kennedy being out of the side, that has probably allowed Hewitt to play that number one role, which is what he really needs to play, which brings us into the sliders. So, And that brings us to Josh Kennedy, uh, who I've got listed as a, a bit of a slider for me. So... His stats are, are good, and at one point he was way ahead on our Player of the Year votes. But with him being out of the side, I think that's allowed, you know, it's allowed Hewitt to really get in the midfield and play his best role. And you know, Josh Kennedy, he's getting a little bit older. He's losing some of that pace and strength, and he's not playing in the way that Sydney really played earlier in the decade when he was that massive contested player. So, yeah, I, I think he's, he's just slowing to, down. He's slowing down, and and I think the uh, the baton is slowly being handed over, and yeah. I, it's going to have to be a bit of a different expectation from Josh Kennedy going forward, I think. Yep, and likewise, Kieran Jack. Yeah. I, I love I love the K-Jack, but I think he's just about done. Um, he's got no impact when he does get selected for seniors. He's never been out. He's never been any good by foot, but he butchers the ball something fierce at the moment. And he's uh, and even though he doesn't get his hand on the ball, he's not having that pressure. He's not playing that pressure role for us well at all, so he's not laying tackles like he used to. He can't cover the ground. He's probably my big slider for the year, and... And uh, I, I'm, if I had to place money, I'd say he's not going to be with us anymore after this season's finished up. Yeah, yeah. So Grundy and Kieran Jack were the obvious retirements uh, with Jared McVeigh, a potential retirement. And there is some talk that he might keep going around, but really depends on his body. And Nick Smith as well. So Nick Smith is the uh, big surprise, along with Sam Naismith. Uh, Nick Smith has officially been ruled out for the season and Sam Naismith is basically going to miss the season anyway. Uh, the knee arthroscopy that he had six, eight weeks ago, there's been no news on that, which to me... They've is gone like, very quiet on him, haven't it's, they? It's the worst possible news. Basically, it could well have been a second ACL. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just interesting that they said an knee arthroscopy and then he's <laughs> not nothing. So, look, anyway, we're going to move on to our match preview. After this break, we'll be back in a moment. Now over to Kent Brockman with some grim economic news. Scott, things aren't as happy as they used to be down here at the unemployment office. Joblessness is no longer just for philosophy majors. Useful people are starting to feel the pinch. I haven't been able to find a job in six years. Huh, and what training do you have? Five years of modern dance, six years of tap. The economic slump began last spring when the government closed Fort Springfield, devastating the city's liquor and prostitution industries. Now, at the risk of being unpopular, this reporter places the blame for all of this squarely on you, the viewers. 
And we are back. Now it is time to preview the round 14 match against Hawthorne at the SCG tomorrow night. So, Josh, uh, Hawthorne have done something very nice ahead of the match. They've actually all decided as a team that they are going to wear the number 37 jumper in their warm-up gear when they're warming up before the match. I think that is a very nice touch and... It's just a respectful thing that Hawthorne have done, given the uh, relationship between the two sides, which I think is uh, a very classy move. Yeah, so do I. And it, it amazes me that it's generated as much controversy as it has. Uh, we won't go into it too much, but um, yeah, I, I think it's a nice gesture. Yeah, it really is. And look, they're not the first team to do, uh, you know, stand by a player when they've been under pressure. But, you know, given the um, you know, what, what's sort of happening society-wise, around the whole Adam Good situation at the moment. Um, you know, you, you look at Sam Newman, who put out a uh, really uh, <laughs> hate-filled tweet not, not, not that long ago, and then backtracked on it only a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of amazing, just sort of like the social feedback on he it. He backtracked, did he? Did he really? Yeah, he did backtrack. So this is what he sent out on Twitter on the 9th of June 2019. And, and you know, I mean, this really re- reaffirms that Twitter really is occasionally the cesspool of, like, humanity. But this is what he said. He said, criticizing someone from another race doesn't make you a racist. The groveling doco by Shark Shit Productions, the final quarter, should be the last straw. Adam Goods initially was booed for taunting Carlton fans. Racist? So be it. And then he said, on the 17th, he goes, viewed the final quarter. It's an expose on Adam Goods as a sportsman and he stands against racism. Goods has my wholehearted support in this endeavor. This wasn't my issue. I was critiquing the line between his playing style and booing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so he criticised it without actually having watched the friggin' thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It wouldn't be the first one. So uh, we had, uh, I think, and last, that, last and week. And that is why we clowned him the uh, last week. That exactly. is why we clowned him last week. And why Wayne Carey got the clown of the week, because he also had a uh, an uninformed opinion that was completely wrong about uh, comparing Gary <laughs> Gary Ablis Boone to Adam Goods, which was completely and utterly baffling. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, um, the the dumbass of the uh, last six months has uh, reneged on what he said, and he's uh, stepped back on it. So yeah, that's that's a good old Sam Newman for you. There you go. Ins and outs. Wonders will never cease. Exactly. Ins and outs. Uh, Josh, who are the ins? Uh, yeah, we're welcoming back uh, the skipper JPK. Uh, Zach Jones is back from the hamstring, and Will Hayward, from whatever it is, was keeping him out. Um, heading out <laughs> is Jackson Thurlow, who's been omitted. Tom McGarten, who has been omitted, uh, and Jerry McVeigh, who's going out with another hamstring injury. Yeah. Look, um, Thurlow won him a bit. No surprises there. No surprises. Look, McCartan, yeah, I can understand. Thurlow, it's a bit like, yeah, yeah, he put, he's probably going to be an emergency or something. He's going to be close to the team. I do like Will Hayward coming in, and uh, it's a bit of a weird one seeing Zach Jones come in. I, I don't know what your feelings on this is, but we've been doing pretty good without him. And he's coming back. Yeah, in and look. Uh, do we really want to see him doing that, you know, that harebrained stuff through the midfield? Or do we want to see him back in defense again? I know we talked about this recently, and I think we said we'd rather see him defense. Yeah, look, I don't know where I sit with Jones at the moment. I really rated his, his at least his work ethic uh, earlier this season in the first half. But when we really needed someone who would take the game on in a team full of flat-footed people who were not so sure about themselves. But I kind of don't want him YOLOing anymore. I think we've got enough talent and enough uh, consistency for yeah. him to not need to do that. So I'll be interested to see what role they actually play him as. Yeah, look, we've we've had um, players like Oliver Florent come in, Tom Papley, uh, who have been absolutely superb in his absence. I mean, Florent's really shown what someone with a bit of dash and a bit of nous and a, a bit of poise, really, can do with the ball. And... Zach Jones, he's a hard head. Uh, he's very hard at the ball. He's very hard at the man. And, and he's a great ball winner and, and ball carrier. But his problem has always been his decision-making and his disposal, which has decision-making has been poor and, and disposal has been <laughs> some of the worst in the team for years without question. So, you know, we talked about it earlier with our, with our uh, review of the season and the turnaround in the last six matches has certainly been the ball used going forward. And uh, I guess the risk is with Zach Jones coming back in, that could be a bit of a throwback to that sort of first seven, eight weeks when it was a bit garbage. That that That's entirely true. I do, however, I am, however, interested in uh, in the Hayward-Menzel combination, actually. Yeah. Uh, I see we played Menzel yep. in Hayward's role last week. 
I actually wonder if we're going to stick them on both wings and just see how that turns out because they're both very classy ball users by foot. Yep. And they both know how to find the sticks. So uh, I'll, I'll be interested. That That's that's the two guys I really want to watch this week and see what they actually do. It's interesting. Like Nick Blakey might even be pushed up onto a wing and you might have a forward line that might be Well, he more, can do it. He can do it. And then they might actually try and push Menzel and Hayward into the forward line to really stretch... Hawthorne's defence and Hawthorne's defence with Stratton missing isn't big by any stretch of the imagination and if they can get the so right... So wonders would never cease yes, the Sydney yes. Swans with a dynamic forward line. What are you talking about? Uh, I know, we don't but... do dynamic forward lines. Can, can you imagine explaining that to your grandkids? I got suspended for pinching. <laughs> I pinched a man. I got suspended. <laughs> Seriously. Oh... Uh... Wonders will never cease. But yeah, look, their defense, uh, it, it's pretty undersized. And, and they're missing talent, if there ever was any talent back there. But they are missing talent in uh, air quotation marks. Uh, just picture me doing it. Yep. So yeah, it, it might be a case if they really push Blake up onto a wing and use his pace and athleticism against, um, uh, against Smith, really, and just try and exploit it going back the other way. But uh, the history... Well, I hope so. Yeah. The history between the two sides is kind of shite. Yeah, we haven't had a great run against them. They've actually had the boot on us for uh, for quite a while since really, I think, the uh, 2010 semi-final. Since then, they've had the wood on us. And really, the only time we've beaten them in the finals was the uh, 2012 grand final. Yep, 2012 grand final. got absolutely embarrassed in 2014. It uh, hasn't been a good run. We've, we've played them eight times going back to round eight in 2015. We've won three games. We've lost five. Uh, four of those games were in Sydney. Uh, three at the SCG and one at Stadium Australia. All of those games were lost by two goals or less, and seven of the last eight games were decided by under two goals, except for a game in 2015 where they belted us by 90 points. Yeah. So I, I must have blocked that game from memory because I don't remember it. <laughs> I almost fell off my chair when I looked up the stats yeah. earlier tonight. No, I, I remember that one. That one was the one when Franklin was out and we had a lot of injuries and Sam Reid was our only forward. And, and this has gone back when... Uh, we had Dean Towers in the forward line. Oh, this that's is, right. This is the yeah, Dean okay. Towers year. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, to be fair, he actually he was actually fair decent for the last half of that year. Yeah, not in that game, he wasn't. <laughs> wasn't he? No, because then we. Oh, I uh, always remember him single handedly almost winning. Each oh yeah, the North Melbourne one. No, 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 in uh, against Frio in Western Australia, yeah, he almost right. single handedly won us a final. <laughs> yeah, he did really well against Fremantle. But after that match, we played the Eagles and we still got pumped by 10 goals. Yeah, we did. Uh, so last time we played them at the SCG, we went in without Franklin and Parker, who both went out with groin injuries. Uh, we knew about Franklin. Uh, we didn't know about Parker's injury yep. until he was dropped from the team later in the week. Uh, do you remember much about the game? Yeah, I do. Uh, we kicked off. We had a pretty good start. And look, it was really a case of Hawthorne just ground their way back into the match. And... Um, you know, Gunston and Popolo were really good for him, but um, in the end, they were just yeah. they were just too good. In the end, we had a good first half, but you know, they they just brought their way back into it, and it was really just their experience. I think in the end, the difference was their experience. That's right, guys like Puopolo and uh, and Burgoyne, who didn't have terrific first halves, uh, were able to have some pretty good impact with the few touches they got in the second half. Yeah. Uh, Shields is pretty good. Uh, Warple, the Warpedo, had a pretty good game. I think that was his debut year, and uh, and despite the fact that that Georgie Hewitt. Uh, pretty much halved Tom Mitchell's output. And this was a season where he was racking up 40 disposals every week. He kept him to 22, but Mitchell still won 16 contested possessions in that game. Uh, yeah. Big boy McAvoy absolutely flogged Sinclair in the ruck. Uh, just yeah, demolished him. Yeah. Uh, but despite that, we had plenty of chances to win it. Yeah, we did. We did. We're up by uh, three and a half, four goals with about five minutes left in the second quarter. And then they got two really quick goals at the end of the, uh, at the end of the first half. And uh, you kind you kind of knew going in at halftime. You're like, if we can stop them from scoring, we were a real chance to hang on because it was never going to be a case of run away with a win. It was going to be hang on to win, much like it was round eight earlier in the year with the shootout, right? But when they got those two goals, I just knew at that time ago we're lacking we're lacking personal well, sorry we're lacking personnel and midfield is way down on what it should be. I think we're just yep. going to struggle to get a win here and. Yeah, as it was, I mean, we're missing our best forward, who's literally our only goal kicker for half the season. And our best midfielder, uh, you know, Kennedy was carrying injuries. 
um, quite a few of our players were carrying injuries at that point. So I think it showed when we went into the first final. And again, Parker, Parker and um, Franklin were absolutely dreadful. Uh, and they weren't the only ones who were absolutely poor in that final either. And they were just injured. No, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, just the, the absence of Parker in that game really hurt us. Uh, and and the, the inability to convert in front of the sticks as well um, absolutely killed us in the end. So yeah. to lose a game by nine points, having kicked 10-14 for the game, is really disappointing, especially when you kick 2-6 in the last quarter and they kick five goals too. Uh, it was just a, 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 little, a, a lack of composure and class in our midfield and um, in our diabolically bad forward line last year. Just just hurt us. It was a game that... We probably still should have won, uh, but we failed at the last hurdle. Yeah, and I think if you look at the stats as well, they really back up that sort of storyline. We had a little bit more uh, disposals, 10 more disposals, and you know we're narrowly beaten contested possessions. But I mean, this is a this is a team that do not play contested football. To lose contested possessions to that kind of team, it was not quite an indictment, but it really um, showed the difference between the two sides. Uh, we had 19 more tackles, but as you said, McAvoy crushed Sinclair and he had 32 more hits. Well, Hawthorne had 32 more hits. Uh, and in the end, you know, it, it was telling we had nine less clearances, um, even though we got more center clearances. But uh, yeah, um, they smashed us inside 50 and they were able to get marks inside 50 on demand when we couldn't even lock it in at times. So yeah, they their forwards feasted and um, ours just struggled something fierce. Certainly did, but that was the story of the second half of last year too, wasn't it? It, it really was, uh, and even the first half of this this season when we're only getting 45, 50 inside 50s and you know, it was coming out even faster than it went in, uh, you know, we were bombing it in. It worked for us in the uh, in the first game that we played earlier in the year because we had one or two players inside forward 50, uh, and that was, you know, we were without Franklin at that point, so we had no choice, right? It didn't work for us against Hawthorne. They just packed defense. Um and they just rebounded it, you know, with pleasure and at ease at times. The uh, third quarter in particular, they just <laughs> walked the ball out. So, yeah, so I was happy with the performance, a bit disappointed with the, with the result, but I always sort of expected that. It was just disappointing to lose Parker right before the first bounce. No, that's right. And a, a Parkerless midfield, as we have still rediscovered this year, um, is a far less potent midfield. Yep. Yeah, it really is. Well, let's uh, go through the other bits and pieces really quickly. Uh, have you got a, uh, a matchup for us, Josh? Yeah, look, uh, we've already mentioned it. Uh, Sinclair versus Big Boy McAvoy. Um, Sinkus is going to get annihilated tomorrow night. There's absolutely no question about that. Unfortunately, it's just the way it's going to be. So whatever McAvoy gives them around the ground, Sinclair has to match him around the ground. And I would even go as far to say that at some stage, I think uh, I think we probably need to give Reed a crack in the ruck, probably more so than we have over the last few weeks to put sinkers forward a little bit more. Yeah. What Reed gives up in body uh, strength and, and, and weight, he picks up just through sheer vertical leap at times. Yeah. So yep. he might prove to be more useful than having Sinclair getting absolutely demolished, but that's going to be a huge matchup for us. Yeah, he has been very impressive the last three matches in the ruck, and he has shown that he can get the height up there to get the tap. And I quite like it, and I, I agree. I think um, I think they're going to have to put Reed in the ruck, not 50-50, but maybe 25-30% uh, of the match and get Sinclair forward. Because Sinclair, he showed in the last match against the Eagles, when he's in the forward line, he gets on a lead. He's almost unstoppable. Uh, so my matchup, is uh, gone all the way back into defense, and it's got to be Rampy on Gunston. Uh, look, yep. you could pick Malikan on Roughhead. I pray that that is not the matchup, uh, but it has to be Rampy on Gunston. And look, Gunston destroyed Rampy last time they've played, the last couple of times they've played, he has given him an absolute bath. So he's going to have to pull something special out. Yeah, this one's might even put a Lear on him. But whoever goes to Gunston has to stop him. Full stop. That's right. And well, whoever goes to Gunston, whoever out of a Lear or uh, Milliken, whoever goes to Gunston, the other guy's going to have to go to Ruffy. All right. So, uh, Josh, can you give us a, uh, a key point, please? Key point. It's just I'm still stuck on the ruck situation. We're going to get smashed in hitouts. Uh, we need to break even or uh, all win clearances. 
uh, both centre and uh, stoppage clearances uh, yeah. to have a chance. But if we let McAvoy be 30, 40 hitouts up over us and we lose clearances, we're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fair point. And we are going to get beaten in the ruck. We're getting beaten in the ruck almost every week now. Um, I don't know whether or not it's a case of uh, Sinclair's just struggling fitness-wise, durability-wise, athleticism-wise. But um, last season, he was very competitive, even against the best players. But uh, this year, he's really sort of fallen off the edge of the cliff as as far as rucking goes against those top teams. And and we shouldn't expect him to beat them either. And the best we can hope for on days like this is to just create a contest. Um, but we, I guess what I'm actually saying is that we need the midfield to be on top. We need our on-ballers to be on top because they're not going to get first use of the ball this week. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Uh, look, I do have a key point, and it's actually around uh, Hawthorne's game style. So they are still playing, you know, the fairly similar style uh, of gameplay that they've played over the years. It's uh, chip, chip, um, you know, con- um, uncontested possession, uh, try and control the ball, and then work it around the uh, around the wings, and then go inside forward fifty, and then just have shots from pretty much anywhere inside forward fifty that they can get the ball. And they do average quite a lot of marks. They average almost a hundred marks a game. So my key point is uh, we're going to have to out Hawthorne Hawthorne on this one. If yep. they're going to get the ball, we've got to get the ball and maintain it ourselves and, and just hold on to the ball. Uh, we, we can't play into their style. They sag off a lot and they zone a lot. So if we go in, we get the ball, we go fast. You know, this is Zach Jones. You know, uh, we're looking at you on this one and Ollie as well. If we go hard, fast and loose and we just bang it in, they are going to clean up for days. Yep, that's true. And and conversely, we uh, we really have to exploit their poor midfield forward connection that they've got at the moment yeah. too. Yep. Uh, their, their forward line was just impotent last week, and that's part of the reason why Roughhead's coming back in, which you know gives Gunston a better run at the ball too. But we our, our back six is going to have to have a pretty solid night. And uh, and I know that a lot of the talk this week has been about how Hawthorne's probably done, uh, but you've only got to look at what they did to Richmond a couple of weeks ago to know yes. that they're not done at all. And we certainly can't let them control or dictate the way the game's played. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they're still a threat. They can still win. And look, if we let them play, how they want to play they are definitely going to win uh if there was a match to beat them and we've been saying it for literally the last six weeks now every single time you've come up an opponent but if there was a match to win and if there's a time to beat them it's got to be now and it's not because they've got players out sure they've got players out uh, they've got a few injuries and whatnot but i think it's more for the swans that if they really want to get that confidence that they can really match it i mean hawthorne aren't the best but they have been a pretty tough team for the Swans to play over the last couple of years. I mean, they've got to beat them. They've got to do it this weekend. They ha- they have to do it this time around. They've got to beat them. Yep, and it's an entirely and it's an entirely winnable game as well. I'll be I'll be bloody disappointed if we don't yep. get a comfortable win this week. We are in a position where we really should have a comfortable win over these guys. Yep, hundred percent agree. And uh, look, on that note, uh, I think it's uh, time to uh, wrap it up. So, Joshua, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, bit of a two-parter podcast. It's an interesting podcast, slightly different format that we're only going to do once this year because of the uh, the buy, and that we didn't do a dedicated buy show. So, thank you so much for joining me. No, absolute pleasure. I always like showing up. You know that. I do, I do. Uh, as always, you can find us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the tag The Swans Blog. And we are also on Facebook with the tag Swans Cast Podcast. We'll be back on Sunday for the match review. Hopefully, it is a good one. And we'll go. We'll just go through whatever else happens on the weekend and uh, any other shenanigans. So until next time, guys, go Swans. Go Swannies.